Shalom. So today we're going to be talking about the blessed sacrifices and what is their origin. If you've listened to very many of my videos, you've probably heard me talk about the documentary hypothesis. And essentially, really at this point, I think we could even move it out of the category of hypothesis and into it just being a fact that the opening books of the Tanakh, Genesis through Kings, that they were written by four authors. And so initially it started off as a very um, much smaller writing. And eventually it the, the two tribes or the two kingdoms, Judah and uh, Israel, each developed their own version of this narrative. And so for uh, Judah... I believe it was the J document, and then for Israel it was called the E document. So the J was for Jehovah or Yahuwah, and the E document was for Elohim. And so in Israel's uh, E document, they always referred to Yahuwah as Elohim until the point um, where Moses is at the burning bush, and then from that point forward, he begins to be referred to as Yahuwah Elohim, whereas the J document refers to Yahuwah as Yahuwah throughout the entire, um, the entire narrative. And so then these two documents, they eventually had a, um, a Deuteronomist source that um, took these two documents and they kind of combined them together into one and then the Deuteronomist added his own take on things uh, primarily his was the book of Deuteronomy and then there was another priestly source which was added in also and that's primarily the book of Leviticus and the second half of the book of Exodus and quite a bit of the book of Numbers so essentially these four sources were all woven together into this you know narrative or this collection of books that we refer to as the Tanakh or at least the opening of the Tanakh and so like the J document the J and the E document it runs all the way through to the days of King David and so um, or the narrative goes from Genesis to King David so the J and E documents would be the non-priestly source and then the uh, Deuteronomist and the priestly documents would both have been priestly sources. So, this theory, the um, documentary hypothesis of the multiple sources, it's actually been confirmed now by artificial intelligence. Six years ago, these uh, Israelis came up with this software. It was uh, an artificial intelligence designed to distinguish parts of a single written text written by different authors. And so when they plugged in the Torah into this machine, it, it identified the two main strands, the, the priestly and the non-priestly. And not only that, but it found the same division that, that most of the scholarly textual critics and, and guys that, that study this, they, they had the same division. The primary difference was is that the first chapter of Genesis usually thought to have been written by a priestly author, but the software indicated that it was not. So so essentially it confirmed what all these scholars have been saying for the last 200 years or so, that there were these four sources in, in the Tanakh. So why is this important? Well, if we're going to look at where the sources, where the sacrifices come from, virtually every scholar that I've read that studies this or has any knowledge of the documentary hypothesis, one thing that they are all universally agreed upon. Now, I'm sure there's somebody that disagrees, but all the sources I've seen, it's almost unanimous that they all believe that the very last thing that was added to the Bible was the sacrificial system. And so originally these... Uh, the J and the E document did not have any of the sacrifices in it, but it was just later added by the priests. 
And the reason they believe is because the priest had a um, ulterior motive. Like they had their own purpose for adding that because they were getting wealthy off of the free meat that they would get from the sacrifices. So one example of someone speaking about the uh, sacrifices is in this book, Moses and the Original Torah by Abba Hillel Silver, where he says that Egypt had a sacrificial system which was undoubtedly well known to Moses and the Israelites. So did all the peoples of antiquity. Moses would have none of it in the Torah, which he gave to his people. He rejected the entire system of sacrifices as a means of worshiping Yahuwah. This was a religious innovation of a startling and revolutionary character. The elaborate sacrificial system which is found in the Pentateuch was undoubtedly developed later under Canaanite influence. In some instances, the very names of the sacrifices were appropriated from them. So why do scholars believe that the sacrifices were all absorbed into Israel from Canaanite sources? Well, the reason is is because through archaeolo- archaeological expeditions and you know, reading these Canaanite documents, they know that they have these much older documents from the days of the Canaanites that actually describe the sacrificial system that they used. And it's like this author here says they even use the very same names like the uh, Yom Kippur sacrifice where they kill the bull and burn it and, and use its ashes for purification, that's a well-known pagan ritual like from all over the world to, to take a red heifer and, and do that. It's not something that's you know unique to Israel. So then if you see much older traditions, as in the, the Canaanites, and then you see a, a newer tradition, as in Israel... It doesn't take a whole lot of detective work to realize that the newer tradition was brought forward from the older tradition. So that's why it's, it's undoubtedly that's, that's the way it was. The Israelites absorbed the practices of the Canaanites. And you can actually see this in the scripture. Second Kings 16 is one example. Sovereign Ahaz went, went to meet uh, Tiglath uh, Pileser, sovereign of Asher at Damascus, and saw an altar that was at Damascus. A sovereign Ahaz sent to Uriah the priest a sketch of the altar and its pattern according to all its workmanship. And Uriah the priest built an altar according to all that sovereign Ahaz has sent from Damascus. And Uriah made and Uriah the priest made it before sovereign Ahaz came from Damascus. And when the sovereign came from Damascus, the sovereign saw the altar, and the sovereign approached the altar and made offerings on it. And he burned his burnt offering and his grain offering, and he poured his drink offering and sprinkled the blood of his peace offerings on the altar. So, essentially, here you see where Ahaz goes, and he takes his pagan practice. He sees his pagan practice at this pagan temple, and he thinks, man, this is really cool. I'd love to have an altar and sacrifices set up like this back home in Jerusalem. And so that's what he did. He sent the description to the priest. The priest built it for him, and the priest began doing the sacrificial system. So for those of you that are following the the writings of the priest, like if you're getting your theology from the Mishnah, and you're getting it from the from the Talmud, and you, know, you, you say you're a believer in Yeshua, but you're only confirming everything Yeshua says through the Talmud well you shouldn't be confirming what Yeshua says through the Talmud you should be confirming the Talmud through the the words of Yeshua because the greater confirms the lesser so and I think you need to remember that this is who wrote those books we have this vision and then this ideology of thinking that the the Levitical priesthood was some righteous priesthood that always did the right thing but you can clearly see here that the high priest is is going right along with this. And, you know, I I honestly don't believe that the kings of Israel would have been able to get away with half the stuff that they did if the priesthood had been doing what they were supposed to. But keep in mind that half the Tanakh was written by the priestly class. So obviously 
they're going to portray themselves as being righteous. But here you see a, an admission of what happened. They were allowing the kings to bring in these pagan practices. And if you read between the lines throughout the Torah, you see it happen all through it. Sometimes you don't even have to read between the lines. So this is where the sacrificial system came from. And you don't just have to take my word for it because there's actually a testimony in the Torah. Because during the time of King Ahaz, that's when Isaiah was in the land. So in the first chapter of Isaiah, the vision of, of uh, Isaiah, son of Amotz, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, uh, Uzziah, Yotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, sovereigns of Judah. Hear the word of Yahuwah, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the Torah of our Elohim, you people of Gomorrah. Of what use to me are your many slaughterings, declares Yahuwah. I have had enough of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or goats. When you come to appear me, who has required this from your hand? To trample my courtyards. Stop bringing futile offerings. The stench of the smoke is an abomination to me. New moon, Sabbath, the calling of meetings. I'm unable, unable to bear the unrighteousness in assembly. So here you have in plain language the prophet Isaiah condemning the sacrificial system. You know, in the in the priestly writings of the Torah, it says that the the smell of the smoke is a pleasing aroma to Yahuwah. But here in this prophet, this prophet's writing, it says that he can't stand the stench of the smoke. It's an abomination to him. And I mean, if you really think about it, if the smell of burning flesh is a pleasing aroma to the God that you worship, do you, are you sure you really want to serve that God? Is that the kind of God you want to um, invoke when you're asking for mercy? Of course, the people didn't repent in the days of Isaiah. And as time went on, more and more of these pagan practices were absorbed into the temple and into the writings of the Torah. In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Yoshiahu, the sovereign of Judah, this word came from Yehuah, saying, Thus says Yehuah, stand in the courtyard of the house of Yehuah and speak to all the cities of Judah. So here you have Jeremiah in the very courtyard of the temple condemning the practices going on there. He says, do not diminish a word. If it be that they listen and each turn from his evil way, that I will relent and will not inflict on them the disaster I was planning because of the evil they have done. And you shall say to them, this says Yahuwah, if you do not listen to me, to walk in my Torah which I set before you, to listen to the words of my ser servants of prophets, I am sending you, even rising up early and sending them, though you have not listened. Then I shall make this house like Shiloh and make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. Now, you might say, well, he wasn't necessarily condemning the sacrifices. Well, remember what happened to Yeshua when he went and stopped the sacrifices in the temple, when he overturned the tables of the money changers and those buying and selling, and then set the animals free and drove them out of the temple. He stopped the sacrifices. The same thing happened to Jeremiah here that happened to Yeshua. The priests and the prophets and all the people heard what Jeremiah was saying. And what, would, what was their reaction? The priests came out and said, you shall certainly die. They were trying to, to kill Jeremiah. The only thing that saved Jeremiah's skin was that there were some um, men with integrity there in Jerusalem. And so these elders of Judah came out and sat at the gate and they convinced the, the priests to turn from what they were doing. They said, look, let's just, let's just put him in prison. We don't need to kill him. And so that's what they did. They put Jeremiah in prison. But notice the reaction of the priests. Very much like what happened to Yeshua. The only difference is there was somebody there to, to stop him. Otherwise, they probably would have uh, crucified Jeremiah just like they did Yeshua. 
And so if you think that it, it had nothing to do with Jeremiah prophesying about the animal sacrificial system, just look at how often Jeremiah is speaking about the shedding of innocent blood. Now, granted, some of these times, some of these instances may have included the uh, killing of, you know, shedding of human blood, because we do know that there was some human sacrifice going on at this time also, uh, sending their children through the fire to Moloch and that kind of garbage. But a lot of these are not. A lot of these you read them, and it's pretty obvious what he's talking about. He's talking about the blood being shed in the temple. And it continues on in the book of Revelation. In fact, it says that the destruction of Jerusalem was because of the sins of the prophets and the crookedness of her priests, who shed in her midst the blood of the righteous. They are staggered, blind in the streets, and they have defiled themselves with blood. And he goes on to say that these priests think that the blood that their garments are stained with is a, sh a sign of righteousness. But here you can see that the sacrificial system is being rejected by the prophets. In fact, all through the prophets you can see that. You can watch my videos on I Came to Abolish Sacrifices to see what Yeshua had to say about it, and I go through a, a great number of these prophets to prove that the sacrifices were never commanded. And they say it over and over again. The original gospel used by the original followers of Yeshua was known as the gospel according to the Hebrews. Now the Catholic Church basically drove it into extinction. They hunted down copies of the gospel according to the Hebrews and destroyed it and did everything they could to wipe it off the face of the earth. And from all appearances, it seems like they accomplished their mission. Hopefully one day there will be a copy uncovered, but the, um, the gospel according to the Hebrews, all copies of it are destroyed. But we do have fragments of it that survive in other writings. And so in this work from the 4th century known as the Panarian, done by a Catholic bishop named Epiphanius, in Palestine, he quotes the gospel according to the Hebrews. That Yeshua is pictured as saying, I came to abolish the sacrifices. And if you cease not from sacrifice, wrath will not cease from you. So this was the, one of the missions, one of the messages that Yeshua was given to spread to the people and to the priests that they needed to repent of this sacrificial system. That's probably why when Yeshua was approached in the 13th chapter of the book of Acts, and the people say that uh, they were mentioning the, the blood of the Galatians, whom Pilate had mixed with their offerings, Yeshua says, Do you think that these Galatians were worse sinners than other Galatians because they have suffered like this? I say to you, no. But unless you repent, you shall all perish in the same way. I think Yeshua's answer came from his own knowledge of why that was being allowed to take place. Because they were shedding the blood of innocent animals. And so when you shed the blood of the innocent, your blood ends up being shed too. It makes me think about the 70 million babies that have been aborted in this nation. And that blood from those babies goes down the drain from the abortion clinic and into the sewers, and it flows beneath the streets of our cities. And because of that blood flowing beneath our cities, one day there's going to be blood in our streets. Because that's the nature of creation. The world will only take so much sin and so much wickedness for so long. So here you have the blood of the animals being shed, and now you've got the blood of the people being mixed with it. <clears throat> Immediately after that story, he gives this parable. He says, A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit and found none. And he said to the gardener, Look, for three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and found none. Cut it down. Why does it even make the ground useless? 
And the gardener answered and said to him, Master, leave it this year too, until I dig around it and throw manure and give it some fertilizer. And if indeed it bears fruit, good, but if not so, you shall cut it down. Of course, he's talking about Jerusalem. And he gives this parable. There's four years in the parable. The owner of the vineyard has been watching it for three years, and the gardener talks him into one more year. Forty years after this statement was made, Jerusalem was destroyed. So one year in the parable equals ten years in real life. So what are we supposed to repent to? If the Torah has been corrupted, what can we what can we stand on? Yeshua tells us that we need to become like little children. Otherwise, we'll no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. So how would a little child look at the Torah? How would he look at the commandments? We actually have a, a, a writing. Epiphanius, the same person that quoted the gospel according to the Hebrews, he mentions this document called the Travels of Peter, which was used by the Ebionites and the Nazareans in the 4th century. And so it was a document written by Clement. Clement was the uh, scribe of Peter. And so Clement followed Peter around, wrote down everything Peter taught, and it ended up being collated into this document known as the Travels of Peter. And there are two different versions of this work now that we have today. One is known as the Recognitions of Clement, which I refer to as the Nazarene Acts. And then there's the uh, Nazarene Homilies, which is also known as the the Pseudo-Clementine Homilies, um, which I also reference in quite a few of my videos. But in the Homilies, Kepha mentions that the Torah has been corrupted. And in fact, the way that Kepha describes it he describes it it's very very similar to what modern scholarship now believes about there being four sources in the torah and according to kepha he got this belief directly from the mouth of yeshua so kepha's debating with simon magus and kepha mentions this about the torah being the mixture of truth with falsehood and Simon Magus says, How then is the truth to be ascertained of those scriptures that say he is evil, or those that say he is good? So they're talking about some of the passages in scripture that say that Yahuwah is good, and then some of them say that things like he creates evil, or so forth, and and paints the creator in a negative light. Kepha says, Whatever sayings of the scriptures are in harmony with the creation the creation that was made by him, those are true, but whatever are contrary to it are false. And so this is a belief of the early Nazarenes that because the scriptures were given as the word of Elohim and because creation was made by the word of Elohim, that the two should line up. So if you see something in nature that doesn't line up with what's in the Torah, then that's a passage in the Torah that's been corrupted. Which, honestly, it makes sense. Both of them should come from the same source. So later on, Kepha says that, but that Yahuwah is not pleased with sacrifices is shown by this. Those who lusted after flesh were slain as soon as they tasted it and were buried so that it was called the grave of lust. He then, who at the first was displeased with the slaughtering of animals, not wishing them to be slain, did not ordain sacrifices as desiring them, nor from the beginning did he require them. For neither are sacrifices accomplished without the slaughter of animals, nor can the first fruits be presented. So notice that it's saying here that the sacrifices were never commanded, and that Yahuwah does not wish for, does not desire for animals to be slain. I had a friend of mine tell me one time that years ago Yahuwah had spoke to him when he was puzzling about this 
slaughtering of animals and about whether Yahuwah desired animal sacrifice. And he said the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, When I create the animals, I put the blood in them. I never desired for it to be spilled. That it was the enemy that spilt the blood, not him. And this, of course, lines up perfectly with what Kepha is saying here. And by the way, Kepha says several times in the act in the uh, Nazarene Acts that everything he's saying he got straight from Yeshua. That nothing he says is anything that Yeshua didn't tell him, because otherwise he would be a false apostle. Going on in the homilies. Kiva saying, if you repent, as I said, and submit to those things which are well-pleasing to Elohim, you may get new strength in your bodies and recover your soul's health. Now this soul's health, I mean, the word for soul there in Greek would essentially be that for your, for your being. So it's like saying for you, you recover your being's health. All the things which are well-pleasing to Elohim are these, to pray to him, to ask from him, recognizing that he is the giver of all things and that gives with discriminating law to abstain from the table of devils not to taste dead flesh so this table of devils is eating the the flesh of dead animals not to touch blood to be washed from all pollution that'd be the mikvah and the rest in one word as the elohim fearing jews have heard do you also hear and be of one mind in many bodies, let each man be minded to do to his neighbor those good things he wishes for himself. So Yeshua taught Kepha that it's wrong to taste the flesh of dead animals. And so what do we see in nature? Like if, if you look at the anatomy of a human being, our teeth, our jaws, the, the way we eat, we're, we're built as a herbivore. We're not built the same way as an omnivore. Omnivores are very similar to carnivores. They're built to be able to chase down prey and kill it. They have teeth to tear flesh. But we don't have any of that. You know, look at your, at your family pet, whether it's a cat or a dog. They're both omnivores. You know, we think of them as carnivores, but your dog can eat non-meat. So, do they have the same kind of teeth as you? Do they have the same, in fact, even the intestines? Uh, many people have, have looked at the intestines of, you know, a human versus uh, a carnivore, and our intestines are very long. Just like all herbivores, we're not designed to eat meat. Our stomach acids are not strong enough to break down meat the way they're supposed to. So we're essentially an herbivore that's eating something that we're not built for. So, does nature confirm what Kepha says here, or does it counteract what Kepha says? How many people out there are dying of heart disease and cancer and other degenerative diseases? And the thing is, when these same people, when they switch to a vegan diet, within a couple of weeks, these conditions heal in people. I've seen people who were so crippled that they were using a walker to get around, could barely walk, and in two weeks' time of eating a raw vegan diet, their health restored to them, and they could just walk down the street like a normal person. The human body is not designed to eat meat. In the Nazarene Acts, we see Kepha saying, If you believe concerning the true fountain of light, I could instruct you what and of what sort is that which is immense and should render not a vain fancy but a, con a consistent and necessary account of the truth, and should make use not of sophistical assertions, but testimonies of Torah and nature, that you might know that the Torah especially contains what we ought to believe in regards to immensity. 
So he's talking about like the immensity of Elohim compared to the immensity of the universe. And again, you see him bringing up this, this doctrine that you should be able to look at the testimony of the Torah and nature to ascertain the truth. So when we look at the Torah, the first chapter of Genesis says that he created us and he gave us plants to eat. It wasn't until later after the flood that the Torah says that he allowed us to eat meat. So you got two contra contradictory passages in Torah. One says we're to eat a vegetarian diet. The other one says that we can eat meat. Which one of these two passages does nature confirm? Nature confirms that we should be eating only plants. Genesis chapter 1. So you remember what I read to you earlier that that artificial intelligence computer program said that Genesis chapter 1 is part of the non-priestly source. The commandment to, or the allowance to Noah to eat meat, that comes from the priestly source. The dietary laws in Leviticus, that comes from the priestly source. So you got the non-priestly source, which says we're created to eat plants, and the priestly source that says we can eat animals. Which one does nature confirm? For this I would have you know for certain that everyone who has at any time worshipped idols or has adored those whom the pagans call Elohim or has eaten of the things sacrificed to them is not without an unclean spirit. For he has become a guest of demons and has been partaker with that demon. So when you're eating meat, when you're consuming the flesh of dead animals, you are opening yourself up to de demonic oppression. In fact, Kepha would not even sit at the same table with somebody eating meat because he was worried about the, the issue of, the, of demonic activity. And you know, a lot of Christians go around like they think they have some kind of uh, what I've called a Jesus force field where they think, well, I've been baptized, I've said the sinner's prayer, so therefore... I'm immune to demonic attack. But then you've got this guy, this Kepha, who ate and walked and talked and lived with Yeshua. And he wouldn't even sit next to somebody who was eating meat. It doesn't sound like Kepha thought he had a Jesus force field on him. He believed that we have to protect ourselves from demonic attacks. And one way to do that is to avoid eating meat. Back to the homilies. Kepha says, Knowing my manner of life that I use only bread and olives and rarely hot, uh, pot herbs. So Kepha's presenting himself here as a vegetarian. He doesn't eat meat. Eusebius, in his book, The Proof of the Gospel, he says that none of the apostles ate meat. In fact, throughout the writings of the church fathers, you'll hear no numerous references to the apostles abstaining from meat. And they say that they got that doctrine from Yeshua. And again, the doctrines of Yeshua confirm what we see in nature. <clears throat> so Kepha really gets into this whole subject of repenting turning from sin and the consequences of sin in the sixth in the fifth book the fifth book of the Nazarene Acts and so I'm going to close out this presentation by reading some of this and again this is the same kind of phenomenon that you see if you if you ever take a person in extremely poor health and you put them on a vegan diet the the, the it's almost shocking how quickly their health can be restored to them. So, book five, starting at chapter three. Whereas, therefore, some men suffer and others cure those who suffer, it is necessary to know the cause at once of the suffering and the cure. And this is proved to be nothing else than unbelief on part of the sufferers and belief on the part of those who cure them. 
For unbelief, while it does not believe that there is to be a judgment, but Elohim affords license to sin, and sin makes men liable to sufferings. But faith, believing that there is to be a judgment of Elohim, restrains men from sin. And those who do not sin are not only free from demons and sufferings, but can also put to flight the demons and sufferings of others. So is it a sin to eat meat? I don't know. Does eating meat lead to suffering? Does it lead to heart disease and arthritis and Parkinson's disease and all these other neurological, cardiovascular diseases? Well, yes, it does. What did Yeshua teach? Well, Yeshua, Yeshua, according to Kepha, taught not to eat meat. So is eating meat a sin? Does it lead to suffering? Yes. From all these things, therefore, it is concluded that all evil springs from ignorance, and ignorance herself is the mother of all evils. And therefore, we must labor for a little, that we may search out the presumptions of ignorance and cut them off by means of knowledge. For nothing is worse than for one to believe that he knows what he is ignorant of, and to maintain that to be true which is false. This is as if a drunken man should think himself to be sober and should act indeed in all respects as a drunken man, and yet think himself to be sober and should wish to be called so by others. Thus, therefore, are those also who do not know what is true yet hold some appearance of knowledge and do many evil things as if they were good and hasten destruction as if it were to salvation. So I know that the Torah says that you can eat meat. And I know that it's convenient to ignore that first chapter of Genesis. But the thing is, if you believe that, then that's, that's, you're in this condition of ignorance. But guess what? I'm, I'm sharing the truth with you, so your ignorance is being cured right now as we speak. From this point forward, if you ignore what I'm telling you and ignore what Keith is saying, then... You're no longer in ignorance. You're now in rebellion. But you could get yourself a copy of the Nazarene Acts. You can find it for free online. You can download a copy of it in PDF form. Just do a Google search for Nazarene Acts of the Apostles. Or you could do a Google search for uh, the recognitions of Clement. And you could read this for yourself. So we must, above all things, hasten to the knowledge of the truth, that as with a light kindled thereat we may be able to dispel the darkness of errors. For ignorance, as we have said, is a great evil, but because it has no substance, it is easily dispelled by those who are in earnest. For ignorance is nothing else than not knowing what is good for us. Once we know this, an ignorance perishes. Therefore, the knowledge of truth ought to be equally sought after. And no one can confer it except for the prophet of truth. That's Yeshua. For this is the gate of life to those who enter, and to the road of good works to those going to the city of salvation. So ignorance is nothing else than not knowing what is good for us. And once we know this, ignorance is gone. Is it good for you to eat meat? Is fried chicken good for you? No. Are fruits and vegetables good for you? You've heard it your whole life. You know that it is. So what is good for you? We got free will. It's a free choice. But I'm just telling you, I'm telling you what Kepha taught, what he wanted the world to know, and what Yeshua taught him. Therefore, before anyone hears what is good for him, it is certain that he is ignorant. And being ignorant, he wishes and desires to do what is not good for him. Therefore, he is not judged for that. So if you've ate meat your whole life thinking that it was perfectly okay and that it was perfectly allowed, then you're not going to be judged for that. Of course, from this day forward, you are going to be judged. Because when once you have heard the causes of his error and has received the method of truth, then he remain in those errors with which he had been so long ago preoccupied, he will rightly be called into judgment to suffer punishment because he has spent in the sport of errors, that portion of life that was given to him to be spent in living well. So, if you're a meat eater, for whatever reason, Yahuwah has brought you to this video at this point. 
the rest of your life, according to the end of this passage here, the rest of your life is that portion of life that Yahuwah has given to you to be spent in living well. So if you choose to continue doing what you're doing, you will rightly be called into judgment to suffer punishment. This isn't my words. This is Kepha's words. God has a plan for you. He wants you to live the rest of your life in good health. And he's apportioned the rest of your life from this point forward when, you, when you've heard these words. That has been apportioned to you to be spent in good health. Now, you can ignore my words, ignore what I'm telling you. And again, these are not really my words. They're Kepha's words. And you're going to disdain the very person, the very creator that brought you to this point to where you could hear these words. Now, I understand you may not give up meat today. But if Yahuwah brought you to this video, it is your duty to search out the truth. The first time this was presented to me, it took me a couple of weeks or so before I really investigated it and came to the conclusion that this information was legitimate. And at that point, I gave up meat. A little while later, I gave up dairy. So you've got that same calling on you now. But he who, hearing these things, willingly receives them and is thankful that the teaching of good things has been brought to him, inquires more eagerly and does not cease to learn. He gives thanks to Yahuwah because he has shown him the light of truth and for the future directs his action in all good works, for which he is assured that there is a reward prepared in the world to come, while he constantly wonders and is astonished at the errors of other men and that no one sees the truth that is placed before his eyes. So I've had this understanding now for a couple of years, and I've presented it to many people. And even today, I'm still in, in shock at some of the reactions I get, the way that people will reject what I'm saying. You may be rejecting it. I don't know. But this, the end of this passage, while he constantly wonders and is astonished at the errors of other men, I'm at that now. I mean, I believe me, I was... I'm sure somebody was astonished at my errors at one point. But when I heard the truth, I repented. And so I'm inviting you to repent now too. <clears throat> but the sole cause of our wanting and being deprived of all these things is ignorance. For while men do not know how much good there is in knowledge, they do not suffer the evil of ignorance to be removed from them. For they know not how great a difference is involved in the change of one in the change of one of these things for the other. So people resist having their ignorance removed. So I counsel every learner willingly to lend his ear to the word of Yahuwah and to hear with love of the truth what we say, that his mind receiving the best seed may bring forth joyful fruits by good deeds. For if while I teach the things that pertain to salvation, anyone refuses to receive them and strives to resist them with a mind occupied by evil opinions, he will have the cause of his perishing not from us, but for, from himself. For it is his duty to examine with just judgment the things that we say and to understand that we speak the words of truth. You might want to reread that last portion there. If you resist this information, then you have no one to blame but yourself. And you have a duty to examine with just judgment the things that I say, the things that Kepha says. Again, it doesn't mean you have to change today. You've had your attention brought to this. So it is your duty to further examine them, to ascertain the truth, not to examine them to try and prove them wrong to examine them to try and ascertain the truth. For he who persists in evil and is the servant of evil cannot be made a portion of good so long as he persists in evil, 
because from the beginning, as we have said, Elohim instituted two tribes and has given each man the power of becoming a portion of that kingdom to which he would yield himself to obey. And since it is decreed by Elohim that no man can be a servant of both kingdoms, no man can serve two masters. Therefore endeavor with all earnestness, earnestness to commit yourselves to the covenant and the Torah of the good king. So remember that if you persist in evil, you are a servant of evil and you cannot be made a portion of good so long as you persist in evil. So what does that sound like? I mean, what are you saying? Are you saying that, that I can't go to heaven? That, I can't, that I'm not saved if I persist in evil? No, I'm not saying that. Kepha is saying that. And Kepha is saying that Yeshua told him that. Part of repentance is turning from your wicked ways. And there may be things that are sins and things that are against Torah that you've been doing in ignorance. And if you've been doing them in ignorance, then, then yeah, you've got, you're not going to be judged for it. But the thing is, now you can't claim ignorance anymore. If you go forward from this point forward and you continue down the path that you've been going down your life, according to Simon Peter here, then that's, that's when you're going to face judgment. Okay, well, that's it. Thank you for listening. I pray that this has been a blessing for you. You have a good rest of the Sabbath and Shalom.